Thank you so much for spending this time with us over the last hour and doing this interview. Happy to be uh, You said you've never been more optimistic about the future of journalism. Sure, I think despite all of the gloom and doom about journalism and a lot of stories about the death of you know, journalism or media, mm -hmm. if you really step back and think about it, um, there have never been more people globally consuming news and news products since the invention of the Gutenberg Press in 1450. Literally, I mean, the tens of millions more people because of whether it's the spread of digital, whether the spread of mobile, um, and rising literacy levels all over the world, including uh, in India. So there's just never been a better time to be in journalism, and there's never been a worse time to be in a platform-led journalism, right? So if you're in newspapers. It's mm -hmm. a very difficult time to be. Uh, but if you think of yourself as producing amazing content that people want and people seem to want, mm -hmm. then the future is uh, pretty bright. So it's a matter of how w what your perspective is. But clearly, journalism and newsrooms all over the world are producing something that people want to consume more and more. The way journalism was produced and actually given to readers mm -hmm. was always to a product. Right. It's just that we never had to think about it because it was somebody else's problem right. to think about it. And the audience uh, was captive. By that I mean that if you are in Mumbai and in the newspaper world, you, let's say you subscribe to the Indian Express. It came and landed on your doorstep. Right? You, it was, there was a lot of inertia involved in kind of not doing that and picking, changing, changing waking up early and telling your newspaper vendor, give me something else. Right? Right. So you sometimes just stayed with it. But in the digital world, um, with the click of a, um, a button, with the flick of a finger, and increasingly by talking to your device, you can pretty much go anywhere you want. So we've become all very promiscuous. So as a result, I think um, the journalism that you produce on a single platform now needs to be produced in multiple platforms. It needs to be engaging. You have to compete with so many more things than you used to before. And I think that's the big difference, and that's the reason why journalists ought to be thinking in terms of what is the form in which people are consuming my journalism and mm -hmm. is that something that I'm competitive on? And increasingly people are consuming journalism digitally. Thinking through a digital strategy is very different from thinking through your strategy in print. And so if you could share with us sort of the core elements of a good digital strategy. Sure. I think um, it begins with kind of acknowledging what you just said, which is that people are consuming if you're, a, if you're an individual journalist, people are consuming my story or my photography or my video in, in a place and in a way that is very different from print. Right? Mm -hmm. um, again, I think most big newspapers now will tell you that 30, 40, 50 percent of their audience is only consuming them on a phone or on a tablet. Right. So imagine if you're the New York Times and the entire experience of reading the New York Times is on a three-inch device, right? You have to think very differently about how you will package and present, how you would uh, make your stories more compelling and how you would allow readers to flow through that device. And I think that's where your building blocks of your digital strategy come in place. Mm -hmm. The other big change is that if you're a reporter, you are really concerned about getting good sources, getting good information, and then crafting a really great lead. Yeah. But increasingly now, because of digital, you have to also think about, well, uh, uh, what is the story going to look like on the phone, first of all, and is there going to be video, is there going to be audio, are there going to be pictures, is there going to be a graphic, okay. and all of these things have now become part and parcel of journalism. So the way you conceive of journalism has to change as well, and that then flows into your strategy. Absolutely. And then there is the challenge of always kind of um, figuring out how to get more people to read your journalism. In, in the print world, um, there tends to be a department called circulation marketing, which goes out there and gets people to buy the paper. In the digital world, there may be a marketing function, but there's nobody out there who will bring more people to your story other than you. Right? You have the tools through, through Twitter and Facebook and other things. Um, so I think the notion that you are responsible for your audience mm -hmm. is now part of journalism or should be part of journalism. So I think those are the big changes in terms of strategy that need to be applied in this day and age. 
and the fact that now your content ap appears on platforms that aren't uniquely yours. So people often are often not yours. yours at all, right. actually, right. right? That creates a different set of challenges challenges in terms of monetizing sure. your product. Actually. Most uh, media companies made a mess of monetizing when people came to their websites, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so now having to take our content and mm -hmm. go to a Facebook or go to a Pinterest or go to a LinkedIn where the audience is and have them read it means that you, at the minimum, you have to kind of pay f for using that platform. Yeah. You have to share revenue. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where um, it's a big challenge in terms of having a larger and larger audience for your journalism, mm -hmm. but them wanting to read it where they are and you having to go to them, which po poses certain interesting challenges. But it's also the reason why uh, video really works, because okay. think of it, if you watch a video on wallstreetjournal.com mm -hmm. or if you watch the same Wall Street Journal video somewhere else, it is possible for me to show you the same ad, either here or there, right? So video is the first form of journalism in recent years where the business model travels with it, yeah. which is part of the reason why you, you're seeing a lot of print newsrooms really embrace video as well, because it's actually profitable. Plus yeah. readers seem to want it. So I think there are ways to figure out this conundrum. Video has been easy. We just have to figure out the text part of it, and that's been a bit more challenging. But what do you think about the willingness for people to pay for media, specifically in India, is that because there are very few, if any, newspapers that charge for online content, do you think that's going to be a right. challenge? I'm, I've heard this in many contexts, and especially in media, that India is different. Right? Okay. And uh, probably is, but the reality is that there has been no country in the world where if you ask a reader, say, will you pay for it? Will they say yes, right? So I think, but still um, in the US right now, uh, 500 out of the 13 or 1400 newspapers now mm -hmm. charge, right? Mm -hmm. It used to be two, about three years ago, four yeah. years ago. So clearly there are ways to get people to pay for something that we think they will never pay for, yeah. right? But there has to be a willingness to take a bit of risk. But more than that, in the Indian context, there has to be a willingness on part of publishers to first say, what I'm producing is valuable, right? Absolutely. It's important, it's useful, I'm spending a lot of money on it, mm -hmm. and I'm not asking you to pay for all of it, but I'm asking you to subsidize it, and dear reader, we think it matters to you, and you will, right? Yeah. But if we continue to rely on this whole India is different thing, the reality is that majority of the Indians, like the majority of the people around the world, are going to live their lives on mobile. Right? So the idea that you will continue to have a robust print business that's going to grow and make money and then make up for the costs of free digital, mm -hmm. sooner or later that's going to come and hit a wall. Right? Okay. And my point is learn from what the mistakes we have made in the West mm -hmm. and don't try to fall into the same mistake. But unfortunately when it comes to media, most media owners and even editors seem to be very hung up on the fact that nobody will pay for it. But they're also admitting that what they're creating may not have that much value. So maybe they should rethink what they're creating and create something that has value that people are willing to pay for. And there are multiple mm -hmm. models, right? You could, you could make sure that people are not cut off from your journalism entirely, mm -hmm. which is the metered model where yeah. some things are free and then there's a freemium model and some things are paid for. Mm -hmm. There are lots of ways to skin this cat, if you will. Yeah. Um, it's the unwillingness to try, I think that's going to really hurt. And at the end of the day, it's going to hurt journalism because mm -hmm. the less or the more dried up revenue sources, the less money you will have to fund journalism and the more you'll have to fall back on advertising. Absolutely. And the sad part is the advertisers know that they are the only source of revenue. Yeah. So in the power equation, they, they tend to get more powerful. I think all of the avenues that social media have thrown up, um, you have you know, self-styled commentators and everyone from celebrities mm. to ordinary people. Um, how do you balance user-generated content, which has some amount of value, sure. with a lot of value, but with sort of this, the science of journalism? I think it begins with a very fundamental understanding and acknowledgement that user-generated content is source material mm -hmm. and it is not journalism. That there is a science and an art and a craft and rules and ethics and standards and practices 
that go into taking source material mm -hmm. and turning it into journalism. Yeah. So in that sense, I think we've caused um, this confusion in our readers' minds by not making that distinction very clear to them. And I think mobile phones are the first device in the history of our civilization where it is both a receiving and a transmitting device. Right? Mm -hmm. So it, it, it has great potential for people to observe things, people to record things, and people to share things. Right? So there's tremendous value in user-generated content in that sense, where if there's an earthquake, Instead of sending a reporter who takes maybe a day to get to some remote part, mm -hmm. somebody living there can actually do that. But it has to be verified, first of all. Um, it has to be uh, presented in the right context. Mm -hmm. right? And I think that's where journalism comes in. That's where our ability to curate, that's where the trust people have in us, yeah. right? the same judgment. And as a companion to a good analysis or good piece of journalism, I think it makes a lot of sense, mm -hmm. but it needs to be treated that way yes. as opposed to become default journalism. What is your perception of the standards of journalism in India? How many journalists do you think think about, for instance, the limits of free speech or what it takes to be critical and to analyze versus just report what they're told? or? To a certain line. Look, having having started a newspaper in India, mm -hmm. uh, Mint, and having run it, and having since then seen it very successfully continue to do what it does, uh, which is a high quality, very honest product, I don't think there's a fundamental problem with journalists in India. Mm -hmm. uh, I think there's a significant challenge with the training they get. Okay. I think um, the Indian journalism schools, with very few exceptions, are pretty terrible, and they don't focus enough on values and ethics and those kind of issues. Right. Uh, so there's a pipeline incoming problem. Mm -hmm. The biggest problem in Indian journalism is not enough editors take time and effort to define, uh, maintain and improve standards in their newsrooms. Uh, and that creates a, you know, it's a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. And um, then there is a significant challenge in terms of um, uh, business practices of certain large media mm -hmm. companies where the lines between um, paid for uh, and advertising led content masquerading as journalism okay. uh, versus journalism. Um, and then the, the other fundamental challenge is that there is um, the, the notion of regulation and self-regulation in India is a myth. Okay. The press council, the editors guild, these are uh, organizations that have actually done virtually nothing to maintain the standards other than prevent anybody else from doing anything about the standards, right, especially the yeah. government. A lot of factors are at play, but I think I blame, I put the blame uh, squarely on the shoulders of editors who are running newsrooms. Mm -hmm. It's the leadership issue. Final question. Mint took on some very established players in a very short period of time. Um, what to you were core elements of success? I think it's a variety of things. Uh, it began with the notion, a very uh, egotistical and self-serving, that mm -hmm. 1.2 billion people deserve a better business newspaper than yeah. exists. Yeah. And then what did that mean? It meant like completely rethinking everything about business journalism, mm -hmm. starting with the name. We, we didn't want to give a name that automatically would put it in a boring category. Okay. So if you look at Economic Times, Financial Express, Business Line. Mm -hmm. There's a stereotypical quality to those names. Okay. So we ended up with something called Mint. And in the Indian context, um, Mint, as you know, re reflects freshness. Mm -hmm. But more than that, if you are successful in India, people say he or she is minting money. So the notion of freshness and success uh, worked very well together. The yeah. size of the paper, the look of the paper. We had to be the anti-business paper. From a writing and a presentation uh, point of view, Almost every single Indian newspaper, especially business newspapers, talk down to their reporters, okay. which is they will tell you what happened. Mm -hmm. They won't tell you what happened yesterday. They won't tell you what the future might hold. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't understand what they were saying, that was your problem. Right? Right. So we, our whole entire premise was about clarity in business, mm -hmm. right? that we, were, we, would be, we would be clear, our writing was clear, our presentation yeah. was clear, we used a lot more visuals. So that's all from the product point of view. From a, a newsroom point of view, a lot of effort went into creating a code of conduct, mm -hmm. a written code of conduct, which was the first time an Indian newspaper had done that. And then not only is doing that, but also then presenting it to our audiences and saying, hold us accountable for it. The only paper with an articulated corrections policy, okay. a couple of others have followed since then. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so I think there were lots of um, practices and then day in day out the biggest uh, sense of pride I get is that m most Mint editors spent all their time editing actually. Right? Yeah. They didn't try to become brands, they didn't try to go out there and kind of participate in television shows and ribbon cutting ceremonies and mm -hmm. you know uh, things like that. So I think that created a culture but to be fair it is easy to do all of that when you're starting from the scratch. If you're an existing paper, it's hard to change that. Okay. But I think it's possible because at the end of the day, while Mint had a few people who were from outside India who came to do it, like me and a few others, mm -hmm. the major uh, by the end of year two, out of the 180 people in the newsroom of Mint, mm -hmm. probably 175 of them were journalists who were born, became journalists here, had been working at other places. Yeah. So it is possible even in the jaded, um, sometimes skeptical Indian environment to produce honest, ethical, high quality journalism. Right. It's a matter of leadership, it's a matter of like persistence and um, kind of saying that we, we, yes, we'll make mistakes, but if we do, we'll correct it and uh, we won't be shy of like uh, being critical of ourselves. Yeah. Thank you so Great. much Thanks. for spending okay. this time.